We went through this last time. All right, relationship is here. Failure is equal to 1 minus exponential minus area of the sample time defect density. There's also a relationship between the breakdown voltage and T effective. The relationship is given here. The breakdown voltage is equal to 0 0.15 times T effect thickness. And we went through this last time. All right. Once you have this, by the way, what do you do with it? Then you go backwards. So this becomes the characteristic of a particular fact. Let's say you're using um, you know, company XYZ as your foundry. Now suppose you have this information, then you know how to then answer the following question. That is, suppose you have a product with you know, X centimeter square of oxide. How long, what percentage of this product will fail? At what time and what voltage, all right? The other thing I did not mention in this, in this whole lecture is the temperature. Turns out temperature is yet another variable, and if you read the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, assigned paper, you will see temperature has been considered as well. Okay? All right. Any questions? This is what we did last time. Yes? Uh, experiments say that if we have a uh, not experiments say that probably thermal oxide will be have a worse quality compared with the, the CVD oxide. Actually, the basic uh, fundamental uh, observation at this point is that if you're looking at oxide um, uh, uh, SiO2, whether it's thermally grown or C or CVD oxide after sufficient um, annealing or densification actually their dielectric uh, uh, property uh, almost identical specifically this equations for the uh, the lifetime actually applies whether we're talking about thermal oxide or talking about cvd oxide okay this often comes as a surprise people uh, used to think that thermal oxide is the best nothing can top that but turns out it's not um, um, there's not much difference but now, if you're talking about defect density, it's another matter. It's uh, very much dependent on the, uh, the equipment and the actual conditions. All right, the intrinsic property is basically the same. Okay. But in case, the, uh, in terms of the uniformity, good. Uh, we we think that probably the uh, thermal oxide will, will be better. That's why uh, the the experiments. Uh, quite That's exactly the whole point. Way. Actually, um, even that assumption is not necessarily a good one, uh, Jane, that um, it's difficult to uh, accept it at the beginning. But I think more and more people do accept that we can deposit very good thin CVD dielectric. All right? Not only people are seriously looking at that from the nitride point of view, but in fact, you know, all the high K dielectric is done by CVD. I mean, of course, there can be even other better ways than that. But those are just ex uh, examples to illustrate why CVD film s do not necessarily have a higher defect density. I know it's hard to, 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 to uh, uh, swallow that right away because uh, we always, uh, I guess, uh, grew up in learning that thermal oxide is the best thing that uh, uh, there is for silicon. That's why silicon is such a uh, dominating uh, technology. Now, uh, there, there's some truth to that, but we also know that um, uh, we're seriously talking about other dielectric now. So what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, SiO2 is really the best there is? Not necessarily. Specifically, thin CVD film is surprisingly uniform and uh, can be of um, uh, uh, excellent quality. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, the, um, so let's just mention one other thing before we uh, move on to some what different um, direction, although we're still going to be talking about thin dielectric. The other thing is called a burning, all right? Now, I was saying that once you have this information, you can start making predictions. For your particular product, how many percent will fail under what condition over how long? Now, if the answer came out to be a very rosy answer, right? Rosy answer. Well, that means you, gee, you probably could uh, be more aggressive using a little thinner oxide or you know, higher voltage or something, right? So let's put that away. What if the answer came out to be a uh, disappointing answer? That it predicts that 20% of your, of your product will fail in three years. What do you do? Okay. 
of course, the best thing to do is you actually, you know, go back to the fab and figure out, you know, can we can we uh, um, um, improve our, our oxidation process or something? Uh, but another very powerful technique is to do something called a burning. All right, 20% fail in three years probably too much. But let's suppose you would predict, say, 3% will fail. Now that's still too large. You don't want 3% if your product fail, right? So what you can do, you can do something to get rid of 3% by, by a process known as burning. Burning just really means accelerate failure with higher voltage and higher temperature. All right. So what you can do, is you can actually put your product on a board and put that board in a furnace and raise it to a certain temperature. And you also apply a voltage that's higher than your VCC. Right? And you do this for 24 hours. And then uh, after that, you take it out, test again to see how many of them have failed. Those that failed, just throw them away. Right? And those that have not failed, you sell them. Right? That's known as burning, of course. If you really think about it, a lot of interesting questions. How do we know those that haven't failed are not just about to fail? How do you know that uh, by doing this, we're not going to make 5% of them fail in three years rather than 3%? And that's exactly why I wanted you to, you to have this concept. You can answer that. If you can figure out how many percent of this, this um, defect has been killed by your, which of defect has been killed by your burning process, right? And how much of those that have not been killed, among those that have not been killed, how much of their lifetime has been used? I don't want to give you in details, but just from this equation, you can already probably figure out what I'm trying to do. You can split the right-hand side into two parts, or interpret this two parts. You know, if I have fixed voltage, fixed temperature, then after a certain time, right? Yes? Yeah? How about you take the inverse of this? That's really some kind of a damage rate, isn't that right? And damage rate will be larger for higher field. So for a given, let's just say use the uh, uh, domino uh, oxide, intrinsic oxide. Suppose I ask you, after the burning, how much li lifetime is left? You should be able to answer that question, right? Not immediately, but after thinking about it, hopefully you'll see there's the possibility of answering that. If I tell you that you take the inverse of this, you can interpret that as the damage rate, right? So during burning, you are damaging at a fairly high rate, is that right? So you consume a certain amount of the life of this oxide. The remaining life, you should be able to still answer how long it will last for a given nominal VDD and nominal field. Right? Again, if you want to know more about this, do the reading. It's in your reader. You will find out uh, more about it. But I think uh, um, at this point, I just want to see it's possible once you know this information. Uh, you will be able to not only tell you the lifetime of a fixed voltage, a fixed temperature, you know the lifetime. You should also be able to know the lifetime of after temperature one and field one and time one. After that, what is the lifetime left for temperature two and field two, which is the operating condition? You see that? Right. That's the way to understand quantitatively this burning question. Take a seat, please. All right. Question here, Lars. Yeah, intuitively I understand why temperature is a, a factor, but I don't see it in the equation. That's right, because um, you know I didn't want to spend too much time on this one particular topic. You know, oxide actually typically is not considered a topic in device cores. Of course, uh, um, um, I personally think extremely important. You know, and everything about device has to do with the uh, with the oxide. So uh, we added this, but still I didn't want to, you know, uh, make this a full, full blown discussion. Uh, this topic cell probably can be a 290 class, actually. You can imagine, I think, dielectric. So um, we cannot cover everything, and, uh, but if you're interested about that uh, in the reading, uh, we, uh, there is information about how the temperature comes into this model. Basically, all the states, uh, the number will be function temperature. G will be function temperature, and tau zero will be function temperature. Once you have that, now your time is a function of temperature, basically. All right? Yes, Kevin. Will the brain test process introduce more defects? Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, what is then the, the final uh, lowdown on this? Uh, what the final lowdown is that 
you could, uh, the, the complicated answer is to say the whole thing depends on this, um, this, this curve. I'll give you an example, right? Suppose you designed your sample, the nominal operation condition is like uh, re really here, for example, suppose, right? Yeah? If this is the case, then if you do some burning on top of your nominal condition, operation condition, guess what's going to happen? None of them are going to survive the nominal operation condition in time, because you designed such that there's very little margin left. But normally, uh, certainly for the older technology, by the way, we're now designing our technology more and more to this direction. So the question of burning is going to become, that's why we have to study these things once a few generations, what is worthwhile doing. But certainly, you know, let's say um, a few generations ago, and certainly for some perfect application right now, well, that's certainly, certainly for a few generations ago, this is the situation. That is, our intrinsic lifetime is actually quite long, quite long, all right? So for example, I use AT because suppose AT is the minimum X effective that will be required to still meet our normal operation for 10 years. Even though AT is required, we actually may be using 150 for that, uh, for that technology. Suppose that's the case, then you can do a lot of, um, uh, of, um, of uh, burning without getting to this final breakdown, then you're OK. I'll give you another example. This is really what we're talking about. Right? I'll give you an even better example. The hope is that, the hope is really, this is uh, what we're, we're hoping, all right? is that if we did not do any burning, clearly these guys will fail after a little bit of operation, a few months of time, right? So if I do accelerate a test that's equivalent to a few months of time, not necessarily 10 years, then you already got rid of all these, right? So basically now you have a new curve now, essentially. Essentially like that, right? In other words, there will be very few percentage that will fail in the, in the next three months. Yes? And yet three months is not very much compared to the margin you have between 10 years and 10 years and three months. You see, that's basically the concept. All right. So you can see the complex question answer is that it really depends on detail of the shape. But the usual shape is such that burning does help. The problem with burning, however, is cost. It's a cost issue. All right. Okay, other questions about um, uh, oxide in general? Discussion of oxide. Now, we have not yet finished the oxide um, um, discussion. We're going to do more oxide discussion. However, at this point, um, we're going to take a break. There are two reasons to take this break. One is because um, uh, this Eta Kappa Nu, uh, Jenny, is that right? Uh, Jenna, Jenna is here to take a uh, survey. So uh, I hope you will uh, um, um, give her the uh, 15 minutes time take the survey. The other reason is that one of my students is getting a student award. I know, uh, uh, well, I guess I would not ask you to uh, go there to support him, but I um, um, uh, was asked to be there, so I will be there. And I'll be back in about 15 minutes. But don't leave after you finish uh, filling out the survey, OK? I'll be back, all right? promotion cases really seriously it's uh, no, not kidding speaking of that I want to ask you a question you know what you just did is a survey for the student organization called Eta Kappa Nu it has been there forever and definitely it's uh, the one survey that all the professors in the ECS department support but just last a few years I've been receiving these uh, 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 survey forms from a group called associated with ASUC I don't know if you have uh, seen those and I just don't know if you guys want to fill out another survey or not. I in the past, I've not asked my classes to fill them out. Um, do you want to fill out another survey? This came from ASUC. Is this something that you get from other courses? You, you don't? You probably prefer not to see that, then that's fine, all right? I will not um, uh, trouble you with that. OK. All right, let's say uh, any um, other questions about uh, the sort of uh, a phenomenological model about uh, oxide breakdown, and based on that, you know, one can actually come up with some uh, some quantitative equations, and based on that, come up with certain uh, procedures for testing oxide, and uh, can try to even make predictions about about uh, product reliability 
and try to get some quantitative understanding about burning as well as other things. Uh, any questions about that general line of discussion oxide? Yes. So um, this curve of D versus uh, T effective is All right. based on experimental data, right? That's correct. Um, but then it, it does seem to follow some mathematical like, is there an equation that describes the relation between no, D and no, X? No, no, no. You know, many people have tried to do that. I always felt that's a little dangerous. Um, to some extent, uh, there may be some underlying equation that, that can predict the shape of this curve, is uh, Sri Ram's question. You know, is there an equation that predicts the shape of this, this, this curve? I guess I'm particularly concerned about this, this term of predict, and I certainly, um, um, I myself don't know of one. But I can imagine, you know, if the material is um, uniform enough, if the process technology is, uh, let's say, uh, unified enough, meaning, you know, essentially everyone uses one company's equipment, uses the exact same recipe and that sort of thing, perhaps we can narrow this down. At this point, I feel the best way to deal with this is this is really a, rep uh, is a, is a is representation of um, of the uh, defects in oxide. Now, to the extent that one company or one fab may produce one set of uh, defect, another company, another fab may produce another set of defect or another machine, another recipe, then uh, uh, it has to be treated as something that's um, um, uh, obtained by actually monitoring the, the manufacturing line rather than something that we can predict. Of uh, course, the hope is always eventually we'll be able to model everything that goes on in the fab and actually you know, predict what kind of defects there will be. But it's, it's difficult, all right? OK. All right. So what I would like to do with the rest of um, the um, uh, lecture is uh, to go through a series of uh, slides with you. And I borrowed this from a um, 1999 IEDM uh, short course. The course was given by a uh, professor John Hauser of North Carolina State University. I probably took only, you know, twenty percent of the slide, or much, maybe even less than that. Uh, and uh, what this is is to give you a um, an overview of um, some uh, new things that may be going on. Some consideration about things like high K or metal K, perhaps. All right. So, so, so that's what we're going to be doing. All right. Start with, there's this curve that looks rather striking. Um, horizontal axis is the technology generation. I think you all know what's that meant by one micron generation, you know, the 0.35 micron generation, quarter micron generation is probably where we are right now, although 0.18 is um, available, and 0.13 just, just beginning. Some company have introduced that, some company have not. And uh, what is shown here is the the, 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 the power uh, um, dissipation, all right? Let's look at the top curve. Top curve is the power dissipation of some uh, process, microprocessor chips, OK? All right? All right. The, um, uh, the middle uh, curve is actually the uh, standby power substratial leakage, uh, more or less coming from the um, uh, so-called roadmap, technology roadmap. You know, looking at what they, they think this uh, substratial leakage can be, all right. And so what you see is that yeah, this uh, sub, this so-called standby power in the CMOS circuit, as you remember, if the circuit is switching between logic states then it's going to consume the power that's uh, CV squared times F. And that is what this top curve is about. You know, this power basically is uh, consumed to perform this, those um, intended uh, um, uh, computational functions. If the chip is not called upon to make those computations, it will still consume power, and that power is called standby power. And that came from leakage current. That's why we often talk about leakage current, substratial current. Now that power actually has not been, it's not a very large fraction of the, um, the uh, dynamic power, except that gap is shrinking with time. Okay? It's moving up. And that's what we're concerned about going into the future. How can we turn off the transistors? How can we reduce 
the short channel effect. And finally, this is showing what gate current times VDD. And that's also a power, all right? You take the gate current, you multiply by VDD, and it turns out this is the power. Now, the reason this is rising very fast is because you may recall at the beginning of this chapter, we pointed out that the oxide leakage current increases rapidly with reduction of thickness, right? It goes up by, let's say, uh, one order of magnitude for every two angstrom reduction, um, maybe and later on will be 1.5 angstrom reduction, will be one order of magnitude, and so on. So if you look at that, of course, you know, this is, looks very, very dangerous indeed, yeah? You do make extrapolations. So that's the, that, that's the problem, right? All right. So that's why um, at one point we already uh, talk about some structural change from the device point of view. Can we turn off transistors, not just relying on using thinner, thinner dielectric? Remember, that's ultra thin body, double gate, we talk about those, right? Now here we're talking about different way. Let's suppose we do want to continue to reduce the oxide thickness, all right? Is there some way to avoid running into disaster just by this increasing uh, leakage current? Well, the way to do that uh, well, I guess I won't want to. there is a way that is to change the material. Don't use SiO2, right? And we'll get to that. Now, here's another um, uh, interesting uh, curve. This uh, plots the oxide thickness, all right? I'll explain what EQ means later on. Let's say this is the oxide thickness, and this is the technology generation, all right? Uh, 250 quarter micron generation, 0.18 micron generation, and onward. It's okay? Following what I'm saying? Now, clearly, many of these generations are not, do not exist yet. So where this comes from is really a summary of the roadmap data, all right? So someone just took the roadmap and uh, plotted. According to the roadmap, at uh, quarter micron generation, we use, should use this thickness. At point one eight micron generation, we sh should use this thickness, and so on and so forth, and make a plot, make a one line, all right? Now, what's interesting is that there have been many editions of this roadmap, right? 1994 is one edition. There's a 1998 edition. There's a 1999 edition. So if you do the same thing with the using data in the 1997 edition, the projection, you see it's much more aggressive. Oxide thickness is much more aggressive than predicted or projected in 1994, all right? And you look at 1999, it's also much more, it's more ag aggressive than 1997. And this actually um, uh, reflects two things. One thing is that, you know, once the, the industry get together, come to get together, agreed, this is doable, everyone's trying to do better than what, what others agree is doable. Because right? if no one says this is doable, probably people would not be so daring. They were probably still asking, gee, can I even do this number? But everyone already got together and agreed this is doable. Then uh, every company is motivated to try to go beyond that, right? Because right? chances are there's not much risk in, um, uh, in, in meeting that goal. Then why don't we try to even beat that goal? And when people do that, well, to their surprise, somehow they could do things either better or they figure out they can tolerate more leakage <coughs> because they went back to discuss with their, I suppose, their um, uh, product uh, uh, engineer, designer, can you really not take this much leakage from the gate? Well, maybe we can. So things just getting pushed out further, right? Okay. But nonetheless, if you look at that, just look at this trend. What this is, is the, is the technology that's actually current at the po time this, uh, this uh, roadmap was published, right? 1994, it was the beginning of the uh, 0.35 micron generation. And then in 97, we have the quarter micron generation. And 99, we'll begin to see the 18.18 micron generation. If you just look at this trend, what actually is being done, now don't worry about projecting to the future. That's even more scary, right? If we're really going to follow this, then uh, we're already talking about this. By the way, let's get the scale. This is 100 angstrom. This is 10 angstrom. All right. The scale unit is nanometer. One nanometer is equal to 10 angstrom. All right. Okay. 
in a nanometer being a MKS or CGS system is a is preferred over Enstron. So IEEE standard would say use a nanometer, don't use Enstron, right? But many people still find Enstron come uh, convenient the number to use. So you will see this to use them. Um, both are used quite often. All right. So do you see the 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 um, the sort of the background of the uh, concern is that. Uh, uh, all the projection says we're going to need, we'll use, are going to need very thin dielectric, all right? And actual practice even beat those projections I in the past. So how are we going to, to deal with this? Can we really allow this, uh, how can we tolerate this leakage, all right? That's the question, all right. Now I can tell you, I'll give you some uh, uh, current density data. Well, it turns out at 12 angstrom, you're going to get 100 amperes per centimeter square at one volt. All right? Okay. So that's certainly very scary, right? 12 Anstron is only here. All right? Okay. 100 ampere Anstron per centimeter square. That's a very large number, all right? That's, um, um, and by the way, Already there are publications, companies say they can use less than 10 angstrom uh, in thickness. So we're talking about 1,000 angstrom, 1,000 ampere per centimeter square. That actually is the current density allowed in copper wire. Okay, if you look at household copper wire, you take this 10 ampere uh, uh, wire and divide it by the, uh, the, the, the area of this, uh, this wire, you're going to see it's actually not as large current density as what we think the gate dielectric is going to conduct. Right. So certainly something uh, quite surprising. I certainly didn't think we'll get to that uh, 10 years ago. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Can we zoom in a little bit on this slide? Thank you. All right, so a lot of people therefore conclude the end of SiO2 gate oxide scaling is in sight. Why? Because tunneling leakage current become way too large for oxide thickness below uh, um, 20 nanometer, but you have to bear in mind this is a talk given in 1999. So why don't I just uh, st stay here and uh, give you a little bit update on this, just exactly where things are, all right? So 0.18 micron generation you were using um, uh, 20 angstrom of SiO2. Point for thinner um, next generation, let's see. Well, let's say uh, so certainly people are, are going to use, uh, uh, say, 16 angstrom. And uh, some of that probably will have some um, uh, nitrogen in it. We call it oxynitrite, right? And it uh, turns out uh, by adding nitrogen to um, the SiO2, you get the oxynitrite, sometimes just just describe SI, um, let's say, uh, ON, OK? And uh, um, silicon oxide, silicon nitride, uh, uh, you can reduce the um, uh, leakage current somewhat. And the reason you can do that is because this material has higher dielectric constant, higher epsilon than SiO2. Silicon nitride would have about 7.5 of epsilon compared to 3.9 for SiO2. It's not quite a factor of two. And if we're not talking about pure silicon nitride, talking about oxy nitride, maybe we won't get uh, even seven, maybe we won't, we'll get only six, but that's certainly already an improvement. As a result, we now speak of equivalent thickness. So you don't have to flip your chart, but in the previous slide, you see the her vertical axis as equivalent oxide thickness. We now speak of equivalent oxide, meaning dielectrically, it's the thickness. Let's say 10 angstrom. Physically, it may be 20 angstrom. If, it's, if this dielectric, thic uh, dielectric constant is a factor of 2 larger than SiO2s. You see what I'm saying? If it's a factor of 10, 10 larger than uh, SiO2's uh, dielectric thickness, then you could have 100, angstrom, 100 nanometer, I'm sorry, of, um, of uh, thickness and still have the equivalent thickness of 10 nanometer, you see, okay? And hence the, the, the term high K dielectric, we'll see later, all right? So 
Normally, the term high K dielectric, dielectric is not applied to silicon nitride. Silicon nitride is not considered in, in some research circles as a high K dielectric uh, because high K, a lot often people are looking epsilon equal to 20 or above. All right? But nonetheless, uh, uh, if you don't worry about this rather arbitrary definition, certainly oxy nitrides benefit because it has higher K than SiO2. All right? So it's probably the first non-SiO2 material that it will be or is getting used in the um, CMOS technology. All right? So that's a given. Beyond this, there's a lot more questions, but silicon nitride will be used. Okay? So that's one thing can be done. Now, if you say silicon nitride, turns out the projection would be the 12 angstrom number will, will be perhaps 8 angstrom. Okay? Perhaps. All right? So that's certainly very nice. If you can do that, okay, cool. But still, some questions: How um, can we go beyond that? Because you look at projection with even eight angstrom, it's very difficult. But right now, let me just say, as far as uh, manufacturing is concerned, in production, no one is yet looking at eight angstrom or even ten angstrom, even twelve. I don't think is uh, um, is still in research. I think um, um, in production, we'll be certainly seeing a fifteen angstrom and maybe gradually creeping down to uh, to twelve angstrom. All right, when would this happen? And uh, so most people think somewhere between 20 angstrom and 10 angstrom, around the 0.1 micron technology node, perhaps will move away from uh, SiO2. Okay, and in reality, this if you when people say this, they often are talking about the the high K beyond silicon nitride. If you talk about silicon nitride, it's happening before this point. All right. Limits are application dependent. Because uh, there's a more leakage problem with DRAM than logic, for example, right? The DRAM refresh time cannot tolerate uh, nearly as much uh, uh, leakage current. Similarly, uh, low power handheld application cannot tolerate as much uh, leakage current as uh, uh, high speed desktop um, um, applications. So, but the point is that there's a strong drive to look for something that has lower leakage than SiO2, right? Okay. Let's see what else. All right. So I just uh, use this as a maybe an opportunity to review some things you have uh, seen before. It also points out polydepletion and loss of drive voltage in the polysilicon becomes more important below 2 nanometer. What uh, um, Professor House is doing here is that he's planting a seed to introduce the incentive to also change the material for the gate electrode into metal, all right? Not only we can talk about the, the dielectric material is going to be different, we can even say the gate electrode material will be different, right? Okay. All right. So is there scaling after SiO2? Okay. When we get to the limit of SiO2, what can we do? So uh, certainly NTRS project continues scaling beyond what we, it appears SiO2 can meet today. So the question is how do we do that, all right? OK. So first, some equations to review the dielectric tunneling current. There's the direct tunneling. We have, you have seen the equation, I think, similar to, to, to this in the, uh, in the lecture, if you look at it. All right? So if you look at this and cross out the, uh, you know, the, uh, the H bars, you end up with effective mass in the dielectric, the barrier height between the, uh, let's say, the gate or and the dielectric, as well as the substrate, presumably silicon, and the dielectric. And finally, the tunneling thickness, all right? Or the thickness of the dielectric, dielectric thickness. It's okay? All right. Of course, in this case, it's not the, uh, okay, I'll leave it at that, all right? And uh, so for f high field, the equation is different. Let's not worry about that. Well, today, we're all concerned about this. Uh, direct tunneling, all right? Actually, low field is really not quite a good word. If I may sort of force you to think about a difference, it's low voltage, and this is high voltage. The fact is that the kind of field that today's oxide uses even larger than the field that early oxide was subjected to, right? What really changed is that the voltage is less than 3.2 volt. If the voltage is less than 3.2 volt, the barrier shape changes from triangle to trapezoid. That's when we switch 
from move from the uh, the fallen Nordheim to direct tunneling, right? So it's not a high field that's causing the a low field that causes low voltage that causes it. the field actually has been creeping up, not down, right? Okay, I'm just taking the opportunity to clarify some concepts involved here, right? Okay, for the same dielectric capacitance or same induced channel charge, that's important. Because to some extent, capacitance is not what we first want to get, although we want that too, uh, in order to control short channel effect. We really want more charge, because charge gives us current, right? Right? So we want, in order to get at least the same induced charge at fixed the voltage, the equivalent oxide thickness actually is this. So this defines equivalent thickness. That is, it's the physical thickness with the ratio of dielectric constants. Right? That's obvious. Correct? All right. So equivalent thickness is what we're really trying to reduce. We actually don't have to reduce the physical thickness. Now, therein lies one possible sort of uh, out of this tight box. It will go look for a, a dielectric that has larger dielectric constant. Therefore, can use a thicker dielectric. All right. Okay. Now, unfortunately, high K dielectric tends to have smaller band gap. You know, even insulators band gap. SiO2 has a band gap of 9 eV. Now, it turns out there's a well-known kind of a correlation trend, at least, between dielectric constant and band gap of material. If you want high dielectric constant, the band gap will be smaller. And actually, <coughs> there is some uh, uh, theory behind that. As you probably know, the uh, absorption and, uh, and uh, polarizability is related, right? If uh, the uh, band gap is small, you have more absorptions, and then you end up with more uh, larger dielectric constants, all right? So, so unfortunately, th this uh, higher uh, m and lower, uh, well, the higher mass is fine, but mass didn't change too much, uh, much, unfortunately. The problem is that band gap really becomes small, because the, uh, uh, and therefore the barrier height is small. So, yeah, when we try to use high-k dielectric, Vb can become smaller, it's unfortunate, okay? So it's not that rosy um, a direction to look. Nonetheless, you will see it, um, overall still is better. Reduce tunnel current for many high-K dielectric. Okay, indeed, many can have high-K dielectric. Okay. Um, well, I guess I probably should have uh, um, brought this, this one up a little earlier, but it's not too late, certainly. Just want to show you that there is sufficient understanding about the mechanisms involved in the uh, tunneling. And this model is now much more complex and sophisticated than the kind of model we have introduced in the lecture that that this slide kind of reviewed for us previously, all right? Because you have to consider how many um, uh, bands and what's the direction of the tunneling, and in that direction, what's the effective mass? You have to remember the anisotropy of the, of the material now. Um, and um, you have to uh, uh, think about the detailed, uh, you know, building work function and, um, you know, what if uh, we just don't have enough charge as we get to close to threshold and all these concerns. But these, if you really model them, turns out you can get very good re uh, agreement with, uh, with experimental data. Vertical axis is the measured leakage current. Horizontal axis is the voltage applied to the gate or to the, uh, to the capacitor. And uh, these uh, larger dots are experimental data. Actually, in recent years, we have more, even more data now. I can tell you they continue to agree very well with the model. And here, actually, there are two sets of models. The dotted line is a, um, is a, um, a quantum simulator. And uh, this, um, uh, this uh, uh, solid line is actually some um, um, analytical model. Both work very well. Analytical model actually works very well. So this analytical model is what's used in the VSIM4 gate leakage for the circuit designers to simulate their uh, gate leakage effect on the circuit, all right? So we can see, we can predict the leakage current quite well at this point. And uh, if you're curious, uh, you know, what it, thank you. What is the, um, um, could you, yeah, zoom out even more, great, thanks. What is the, uh, um, some details of the uh, tunneling? What well, turns out, just give you a little uh, uh, glimpse of what's, what happens. 
if you look at SiO2, turns out there are three components tunneling that are important. There's tunneling from the conduction band of one electrode to the conduction band of another electrode. In this case, you would definitely call this electron tunneling, right? Although <coughs> the student decided to call this, uh, let's say, electron conduction band tunneling. But, but it's fine. I think many people would just call this electron tunneling. There's also tunneling of the electron from one valence band the valence band of one electrode to the valence band of another electrode. This is called the um, uh, hole tunneling. All right? Most people will agree this can be referred to as hole tunneling. Okay? Which really means the electron moves from this side, from the right hand side to the left hand side. <laughs> but we draw this as a hole moving from left hand side to the right hand side. Okay? This is called hole tunneling. This is more complex. There's no standard name for that. You know, if the electron tunnels from a valence band of one electrode into the conduction band of another, what do you call this? Okay? So the student called this valence band electron tunneling, electron valence band tunneling. All right. And turns out, depending on whether it's MMOS or whether it's PMOS, and whether you're inversion, whether you're accumulation, and uh, the different uh, component dominates. I'll just give you an example here. In the MOS case, inversion, turns out this component dominates. In the case of PMOS in inversion, this component dominates. Okay? And this component actually also dominate in the case of tunneling, for example, from a, um, a, um, a P-type polygate into the substrate. All right? Because in a P-type polygate, there's not much many electrons. But this, this uh, understanding actually took years before we get there, because there was a lot of thought, maybe there's enough of you know, poly band banding, that accumulation or inversion that will have electrons. Now we understand in the case of P plus poly, actually there are just so few electrons, this component dominates, all right? Okay? It will be the, uh, the electron tunneling from the valence band. Okay. So turns out we identified these three components are necessary. Actually, there are, there are more components you can draw, but these three are the important components, okay? Uh, let's say the um, now what's interesting once you have a model like this you can say well you know just curve fitting you can figure out you know what kind of a barrier high what the effective mass you finally fit this experimental data in SiO2 right what's interesting is that you know another student will take these equations and change the barrier high that's known for nitride and effective mass that's known for nitride and and uh, then compare with the uh, data with the nitride and found very good agreement all right i'm showing you some agreement first this is the still the sio2 case all right if you look at the sio2 case you can see if you look at the current gate current um we can actually separate into gate current is the you know, is it due to the electron tunneling or due to hole tunneling? We can separate them. How do we separate them? You may or may not remember when we talk about hole generation in the SiO2 as part of discussion of what's potentially, the, what's possibly the reason for damaging the oxide under high field stress. We mentioned a technique called charge separation, remember? It's a way to, to separate the hole current from the electron current in an MOS transistor. So the same technique was applied here. You can actually separate which component due to hole tunneling, which component due to electron tunneling. Turns out you need to have both uh, uh, modeled right. And after you do this right, you can model the MOS and PMOS over range of oxide thickness and uh, inversion accumulation and all model quite well, right? And this is example then that same equation, just changing the number appropriate for into the number that appropriate for nitride, and this is the data, okay? Measurement and the uh, and data agree very well, okay? The model and the uh, and, uh, data agree very well, okay? So, and uh, so each R U is the student that uh, extends this into the nitride. So then now we can predict, you see, oxide actually, there's a lot of empirical data already, at least up to this point. But with the model, you now have some confidence. You can do extrapolation, what happens to be a pretty much a, a straight line in this case, all right? Now, with the nitride, there's very little data right now. But, you know, with the help of this model, we have some confidence that we think we know how the nitride is going to uh, to move. So just by looking at that, you can kind of predict, suppose we're willing to tolerate 100 ampere per centimeter square. I was saying, you know, for nitride, we probably can use 8 angstrom. 
for the oxide, you would, you know, draw a horizontal line to here, right? Is that right? Yes? And you're going to get about 12 angstrom or so, right? So that's the idea. And also, just because of the material difference, turns out the worst case for one, uh, for, for the SiO2 is the MOS case. MOS will see more leakage current than PMOS fat. But for the for the SI, uh, for the nitrite, turns out PMOS fat will show more leakage than NMOS fat. That's uh, you know, certainly some new information. Um, I'm sure people will watch the data more carefully from now on to see if that's really true with the nitrite as a dielectric. All right. So possible gate stack. Now the term gate stack is often used to refer to the combination of the dielectric and the gate electrode. This is because both of these, first of all, are, you know, being considered as, a, as a, let's say, uh, variables now. And secondly, there's some reason to, to say, hey, you really should not only consider the, 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 uh, the, the gate dielectric. You should consider that together with the gate electric material because there may be chemical reaction between some high K dielectric and gate material you use, for example. So often this gate stack is a term that you, you hear now, all right? So uh, in this particular slide, there's uh, this uh, picture, let's see, okay? It says, all right, the most common stack today is polysilicon with SiO2. In fact, the stack, okay? And uh, we are now beginning to see there will be polysilicon, silicon nitride, SiO2. This is also sometimes referred to as, um, as oxy nitride because it's very hard to say, you know, whether there's a uh, sharp boundary here or not, you know, depending on how you put down this nitride. And uh, sometimes we think the nitride is more uniform, other times we think it's more uh, at the high, uh, nitrogen content closer to the surface. But if you had a choice, it's believed that this would be a good uh, combination. That is, you still have a little thin SiO2. This probably gives too large thick SiO2. Because after all is said done today, I can tell you the best interface is still between SiO2 and silicon. It's a fact. Now we're beginning we're to, be, to, to be willing to consider other interfaces. But so far, all the data still says that SiO2 and silicon interface <coughs> still the best. Best in what sense? Mainly in the sense of mobility, all right? And that's also related to interface traps. So chances are right now, I think many people believe it would be very good if we have a thin SiO2 thickness. We don't know how thin is enough. You know, maybe four or five angstrom is enough. Certainly seven or eight angstrom would be very good, right? But perhaps four and four, five angstrom is enough. And then just tag on a layer of pure nitride. That would be the, the best right now, the thinking is that, okay? This nitride does several things. One is this gives us higher dielectric constants, allow us to thicken the dielectric, as a result reduce the tunneling current. That's number one. Two, it is chemically a very stable material, and certainly it will allow you to put on all kind of a, a gate electrode material. And in addition, because it's a very dense material, it will prevent boron from diffusion, diffusing from the polysilicon in through the dielectric into the silicon, and therefore avoiding or minimizing the problem known as what? Boron penetration or dopant penetration. Remember that term? All right. So those are the, the reasons that's, uh, that um, it's perceived that it's having a lot of uh, nitrogen near the top of the dielectric will be very good. Pure nitrile will be very good. So there's a lot of technology questions and equipment. You know, companies are all trying to come up with the best material to dominate this, this application. All right. So another possibility is go from polysilicon SiO2 to maybe metal, right? And, uh, and use high K as dielectric. But there's a lot of considering that maybe high K is too reactive. Maybe we need some kind of interface material. This could be nitride or even oxy nitride. But when you do that, it really becomes difficult to see how we can get a total you know, down at 8 or below 8. Remember, if we try very hard, we may be able to push this close to 8 angstrom, right? right? It's very hard to see how we can do this. Yeah. But because you have a higher dielectric constant, uh, aren't you getting increased capacitance? Uh, you know, without without getting a decreased TOX, 
you, you know what I mean? You can increase capacitance because capacitance is proportional to... Sure. Yeah. But the question is that, suppose, let's assume, this interface are still the so-called oxynitride. In fact, that is what mostly people are considering, right? So you need two of these. Now, how many Enstrom do you give each of these two? Suppose you give four Enstrom each. You already used up your eight Enstrom. You have infinite uh, K here. It's not doing you any good, right? So that's the question. It's just how are we going to design the stack? Uh, was that your, your comment, or did I misunderstand your comment? Yeah, I'll ask your question. All right, OK, all right. So that's the question, is that if we really need this interfacial dielectric, and if it's uh, oxynitride, then, then how do we really do that? So certainly, even this slide's a little old. People are really thinking, can we really you know, get rid of these? And today is not clear, all right? All right, OK. And by the way, uh, may the another possibility is that metal get introduced before high K dielectric. Will be metal on top of oxynitride SiO2. That's certainly possible, all right? And may I should really have gone through this with you. Maybe starting here, maybe this looks like right, but this actually is what people mostly are looking at right now. It's polysilicon on oxynitride, a little bit of, uh, you know, closer to oxide to try to maintain a good oxide uh, interface, right? Now, whether we would do this before we introduce some other high K dielectric, it's not clear. Turns out metal gate is also very difficult. I'll point out some difficulty. And uh, then there's this possibility, right? There's also the possibility going directly from here immediately to, to there. So it's not clear how we're going to get get to this high K and metal, presumably. All right. Well, some materials, OK? Uh, it's a very widely uh, distributed uh, information in the um, in the uh, um, um, high K research community although you know our own students when they look at this not when they look at this after they have done <laughs> enough research they say actually this is not complete in uh, this is uh, just a compilation of the material of which informations are available all right there are a lot of material that people have not yet studied their cell dynamic stability relative to silicon, and there may be even other opportunities. Okay? But a lot of people have been looking for opportunities here based on the uh, information on this. I will not uh, uh, look into this uh, more, but instead just tell you some of the materials that are looking attractive. Hafium oxide at this point is probably the uh, leader of the pack. Right? There are several things. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I, I should say zirconium oxide is leader. But hafnium and zirconium are the two um, materials whose oxide and silicate have been studied a lot. So I just give you some, some s this talk just took out some, some, some uh, I guess, examples. If you look at hafnium oxide, you can see if you look at the leakage current versus equivalent thickness for given voltage at one volt, I guess. All right? So current density at one volt plotted against equivalent thickness, equivalent SiO2 thickness, all right? You can see at any equivalent oxide thickness, hafnium oxide indeed has several orders of lower leakage than SiO2, all right? Okay. Of course, some of our own students have done research, and they think this is not quite right. And actually, the slope is going to be larger, so we will see what it is, all right? But certainly, it does look like uh, um, there's uh, advantages, OK? And uh, the problem really is data is not that easy to come by and before I leave this and just say, if you just look at data, it's hard. But if you really put in some theories and if, if you, you know, just say, I have some confidence in theory, the only thing I can change is to change the, you know, effective mass and change the barrier height, for example. Is that right? Okay. Remember the equation for direct tunneling? Right? If you really look at this, since this is all in one product term, really there's only one variable, basically. Right? They're all in one product term. So if you really believe that, you quickly come to the conclusion that you cannot change the location of this curve and the slope independently. Any curve that's lower also will have a larger slope. Right? So if you, you know, combine some data with some theory, it's probably more likely for you to reach that truth. All right? It's all very often, uh, you know, we all do this uh, as researchers. We like to, to believe the best data. When we see something looks good, we immediately draw a line and start extrapolating that, right? not knowing whether, you know, additional experiment really show that's right or not. When we see data that we don't like, we say, ah, that's bad data. Let's not worry about that. It's, uh, all right. The, uh, 
So another um, uh, study, uh, this is uh, both of these two uh, study came from University of Texas in Austin. Jack Lee um, so, and his student showed the previous curve. This is Professor Dean Lee Kwong and his student did this uh, uh, work shown here. Again, current density versus oxide thickness. Here, they were looking at tantalum pentoxide. And um, tantalum pentoxide is not uh, being considered very seriously right now. Um, it's very difficult to say why one material is better than another. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, the packing order will continue to change in the next few years, but pentaplasma is not um, uh, considered a front runner right now. Okay, then um, let's look at the advantage of uh, advanced gate electrode material, all right? Alternative to, to the uh, polycrystalline silicon. Replacement for polysilicon is desired due to limited active doping density. In other words, polysilicon has limited active doping density. So therefore, you have polydepletion, right? And polysilicon depletion effect. Doping activation and penetration may also be a major problem with high K dielectric. Actually, uh, some recent data shows it's not worse than SiO2. But again, need more study to be c clear on that. Uh, dual metals are required as replacement to achieve low threshold voltage. In other words, if we're going to replace the uh, polysilicon with metal, we need two different metals, one for MOS, one for PMOS. You have already seen why we need the M plus poly for one N-channel transistor and P plus poly for P-channel transistors because we need two different work functions as the gate material for, for PMOS and MOS. Is that right? We need two work functions. So if you use metal, you better find two different work functions. Finding two work functions uh, may not be that difficult or definitely complicate things because both metal has to be stable chemically, proper temperature, and all these things. And in addition, you also have to worry about how do you put metal A on NMOS and metal B on PMOS. You know, if you put metal A on both, and then etch, etch, etch away metal A from one type of transistor, and then deposit the metal B, then the etching is a problem, right? That means you're going to etch away the thin dielectric. You're going to attack thin dielectric. All etching process will be not 100% uh, selective, right? When you etch that away this metal, you're going to etch that very thin dielectric. We have very thin dielectric to begin with already, and they're probably very fragile. So can you really do that? So how do you put two different metal on, uh, on these two transistors? And there's a lot of uh, research going on there, right? You can think about that. Maybe you want to think about that, what ideas you have, right? OK. Uh, chemical stability is a problem, all right? Let's not go too, too much easier to disappear. First, looking at the work function. Well, it turns out there are some work functions that are around the, the uh, um, some metals that are around the work function of the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the the um, um, uh, the uh, what, what I'm saying uh, around the uh, the the M plus poly work functions. What we want to say, right? E C means the M plus uh, uh, work function, so e M plus poly is work function. All right. So you want to replace M plus poly. Look for something around here. These materials tends to be chemically unstable. All right. And uh, so somewhat difficult, but we have, may have to learn to live with them. There's a group of material with work function close to the P plus uh, uh, poly's work function. So they are there. We can try to look for them and work with them. The problem with these materials, they are very chemically very stable. Therefore, they're difficult to etch. All right? But again, we can try to learn to live with them, learn to live with them. And then in the middle, we have uh, most material tends to be in the middle, including all the uh, silicide tends to be in for the middle. So for the middle, we probably would not be able to use them as the, um, the CMOS, and, um, unless you, know, you're, you use some other ways to, uh, to, to, to control this short channel effect. Let me just review for you why we need a certain work functions for MMOS. The reason we need this work function in MOS is that we want to use heavy doping. We want to use heavy doping in order to control short channel effect. Once you use heavy doping, you, ne you need this threshold, you need this uh, work function in order, in order to get the right threshold. Otherwise, the threshold voltage will be too large. That's simple. Okay? All right? But 
Using heavy doping to control short channel effect is not the best way because heavy doping gives us very many bad things, including hurting our mobility. Right? So that's why we use, showed you one example of just thin body, double gay. You know, they use the thinner body thickness to control the short channel effect, right? To minimize the need for that uh, small XD max. So if you do that, then you can use other kind of work functions for, for the, uh, uh, to get the right threshold voltage. And in fact, you have to use other work functions for the right threshold voltage. That could be a problem as well, right? Okay. All right. So I think we've seen this before. And uh, well, I guess that's the end of um, what we prepared for this lecture. So uh, any questions? This is kind of an a, um, introduction to where things are. And um, I probably did not give you enough material um, for what you like to hear. Why don't you ask me some questions? Maybe I can even prepare some um, uh, additional material for the next lecture. What are you interested in about this topic? Anything that particularly interests you about the uh, new uh, gate stack, about high K, about the uh, metal gate, or? Yes? You keep saying for the PMOS that it's difficult to find a metal with the appropriate work function. Well, there's only so many metals, and they've had quite a while to work on it. Is there a metal that has the appropriate work function? It's uh, really uh, still not easy. To, for example, what we find out is that um, the uh, work functions are quite variable. You know, we're learning, just the students here are learning a lot of things. For example, these work functions are work function measured in vacuum. Yeah, That's what you find in the literature. But when we put on dielectric, they're different. We find out they're different depending on what dielectric you use. And so some student has to work out a theory to understand that, why that's the case. And they also seem to depend on the deposition process, vary with annealing. So there's a lot of questions like that. And uh, so um, it's not going to be easy, right? It's not going to be easy. And in addition to that, there's the question about reaction. But I just mentioned a few things that uh, um, that you may not have thought about. It's, uh, it's difficult. All right. OK, other questions? Yes? High-K high material tends out to have a lower barrier. Yeah. The reason is this, and you can help me. I was looking for this uh, term in physics. I, I want to say, uh, what is this? There's a relationship. I'm sure one of you can help me. Kevin, try to help me if you can, all right? The, uh, I always said there's a, um, there's a um, relationship that relates the, the real part and the, um, the, uh, the um, uh, uh, imaginary part of the dielectric constant. In physics, there's a well-known uh, relationship between these two. One's related to the... To the uh, um, to, to the other integrated uh, with respect to frequency. Um, what term? No, you don't know th uh, this? All right, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, find it and let you know. But anyway, to answer Jean's question, uh, I thought if you knew the name, then it answers that question right away. That's because it looks like it's not a familiar thing. What it is is that um, it's a well known fact that, um, let me use a, um, a, um, a, uh, a, 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 um, Maybe using a resonant circuit, maybe that could be an example. Uh, I'm not quite sure it's such a good example. I myself am not very familiar with resonant circuits since I started this. Maybe some of you can help me figure this out, because I certainly know that it's often used as an uh, analogy to this physics relationship. All right? If you think about a, a, a resonant circuit, resonator, certainly this referred to the loss. This, what would I refer to? Actually, I'm not quite sure now. Maybe refer to the... Um, I don't know, to the, um, what would I refer to? Um, uh, would be equivalent to, uh, let me think about that, all right? One would be the loss, the other will be, well, maybe that's not a good, uh, um, all right. I cannot answer the question right now, but let me just say, tell you, you what I know of is that there's relationship between the, the uh, um, um, dielectric constant or polarizability and absorption property of the material. Specifically, the more absorptive the material is, 
when I'm talking about the same frequency. For example, if this material absorbs a lot of short wavelengths light, when we get to little longer wavelengths, when it doesn't absorb and you measure dielectric constant, you're going to find out it has very high dielectric constant. If a material doesn't absorb uh, light near one um, uh, micron of wavelengths, then at 1.5 micron wavelengths, you're not going to see a larger uh, dielectric constant. All right. Uh, example of bond. You know, glass, for example, it's pretty transmissive to a lot of UV light, things like that. And that's why it has very low dielectric constant, you know, 1.4. All right. When you go to silicon, for example, it certainly already has m much higher dielectric constant, right, than glass, right? And uh, let's say uh, you may or may not know uh, germanium has higher dielectric constant than silicon because of lower band gap, right? so it absorbs more, uh, more, uh, 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 more. <laughs> let's say frequencies. It's more absorbing over larger frequencies. Then it's going to give you more dielectric constant, right? Okay. Let me um, say that we end the uh, taping here. Um, but don't go. I want to ask you a question before I let you go. Actually, I have another reason not to let you go. We're supposed to have a discussion today. Is that right? Today, Tuesday. All right. Why don't I just uh, ask you this question? You can consider.